Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. Those of you who have uh, been with us for a while know that we've been studying the life of Jesus. And uh, we're down into the last few months. Jesus has spent about six months in, in relative solitude with his disciples where he's trying to teach them and, and get them ready for what they're going to have to go through. And uh, so he was doing that up north and up around Tyre and Sidon and then came back down. And now he's going to start another phase. And that phase is introduced in Luke 9, uh, cha uh, chapter 9, and verse 51. And so uh, turn your Bibles to Luke 9 and verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, his ascension, he steadfastly had set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now, what was, what does this kind of imply? Where, where, do, where do we go with this? Okay. <clears throat> there are people, I would disagree with this somewhat, but there are people who believe that the entire purpose of Jesus' coming to this earth was for him to die as a sacrifice for our sins. I think there's a lot more to it than that. But certainly Passover week and the, the death of Christ on Calvary or Golgotha, depending on what you want to call it, was a major, major factor in, 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 in the, this world's history, really, in the world's history. The history of the universe. The history of the universe, <laughs> exactly. And so Jesus has been training his disciples for the last six months. And now in the final six months, he says, okay, now I'm going to turn my attention to the big crowds. And he can't do that in Judea. They would have arrested him and tried to kill him. He can't do that in Galilee anymore. They would have arrested him and tried to kill him. They already threatened to do that several times. So now he's on the other side of the Jordan River, and he's, he's drawing a lot of Jews, but a lot of Gentiles as well, and he's repeating many of his teachings that he, he formerly had made in Judea, <coughs> excuse me, in Judea and Galilee. He's repeating many of those teachings in a different, slightly different context for the people of the Gentile people on the other side of the Jordan River. These would be Greeks, a lot of them, so forth. There were 10 Greek cities over there. And so Jesus is now getting ready, he, and he's preparing. The, his goal, really, is to get as many people watching him as possible and focusing on the fact that he's going to be arrested and tried and crucified on Passover weekend coming up. So he starts out traveling through Samaria, and what happens? Uh, they take kind of a dim view of him coming to town. Because? He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to Jerusalem. Now, if you want to serve, if you want to serve worship here at Mount Gerizim, that's fine. But if you're on your way to Jerusalem, and how, what do the disciples feel about that? What do they think of that whole idea? Well, They're, they should uh, think we ought to call a little fire down on top of them. <laughs> why do you suppose the disciples would say that? Any, any extra hints or clues? Isn't that what Elijah asked to happen? And At almost this, in that location. exact same location. Yeah, that's what Elijah, remember those people, groups of 50 were sent out to arrest him and he called fire down on them. Another group of 50 came out to arrest him and he, arrest him, and he called fire down on them. And they were, may have been talking about that. And then suddenly here they are, short distance away, and the Samaritans are rejecting him. And John and James and John said, call fire down on them. And does that sound like the God that uh, you worship? No. No? As a matter of fact, Jesus rebuked them. It reminded me of uh, Jonah mm -hmm. 
in Nineveh. Mm -hmm. But Jesus said, no, no, he, he didn't want to destroy them. Okay, well, he, he said, you don't know what's inside you. Yeah. You don't know what kind of a spirit is driving you when you say something like that. Yeah. So the difference between Jesus not calling fire down here and Elijah calling fire down here is what the motivation for. Yes. In, 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 yeah, the attitude. Why was, it, why was it a good thing at one time and bad at another? Well, in the case of Elijah, here's one man standing up against these people. And, and if, if nothing had happened, uh, I mean, remember what had happened to Mount, on Mount Carmel. Yeah. If they had had even the slightest hint that their sacrifice was starting to burn or something like that, they would have torn Elijah limb from them. And they would have done the same thing here if they, had had, if they could have gotten away with it. So God just has to step in. And, and this is one of the interesting things. If you look carefully through the stories of Scripture, in the Old Testament especially, you'll find that God rises up and does some of these more dramatic things when he's directly confronted by a pagan god. In Egypt, it was Jehovah or Yahweh versus the Egyptian gods, and in many other cases. And this is the same story. In Elijah's case, we've got a king who's worshiping a pagan god, and he says, go out there and arrest that, that prophet of Yahweh's. And God says, okay, you're a pagan god. Let's see how well he can stand up to me. And at the end of time, yeah. we'll be facing exactly the same, same issue. Same story again. So what we then have, what we find out in, in terms of this, this last six months of the life of Jesus, he spent almost all of that time, with some very remarkable exceptions, brief periods, he spent almost all that time on the other side of the Jordan River in Perea. Now, when you look at Matthew, what does he say about that time period? Essentially nothing. What about Mark? Nothing. What about John? Virtually nothing. Who is the one that talks about this time period? The Gentile. The Gentile. <coughs> Excuse me. Luke. The Gentile, Luke, the, Luke, the Gentile physician. And he takes, he goes through this, this period fairly carefully and in quite a bit of detail. Why do you suppose that would be? Well, nobody to that time had documented for posterity. Okay, that would be part of it. And what else could you say? And, and when did Luke document this? I mean, he was a Greek physician from, from Greece, and he was practicing somewhere up in, in Troas when Paul ran into him. And how did he get off over here on the other side of the Jordan River? Was it perhaps when Paul was in prison in Jerusalem? Very likely because he stayed with Paul pretty much for the rest of his life. L very likely when Paul was in prison in Caesarea Maritima. Uh, for those two years after he was arrested in Jerusalem. It's most likely that it was during that time that Luke traveled around, and it would be easy for him to travel in the Greek speak in the more Greek-speaking areas and interview people from the Greek cities to find out, okay, what do you, what do you know about Jesus? What do you yes. know about Jesus? Yeah. What did you hear about him? Did you have any experience with him? Kind of, so he ends up reporting <clears throat> in considerable detail about this time period. Now, it's true that many of the things that um, are, that happened during this time period are repetitions of, P, of Jesus' teachings that he had made earlier in Judea and Galilee. So we, I don't think we need to go into great detail, but you will find out when looking at Luke's writings that he focused a lot on what? Well, first of all, we need to understand that Luke's gospel is the most comprehensive of all of them. There are more separate events in the life of Christ recorded by Luke than by any of the other gospel writers. He records more miracles. He records more speeches. These are all things that might have impressed a Greek audience, the kind of stuff he would be interested in. And he's getting this information secondhand. He was not like the others, a witness no. to all of these. And he, and, and he just says that in so many words. You remember back in Luke 1, he just says, let me just read those words for you very quickly here. 
Dear Theophilus, many people have done their best to write a report of the things that have taken place among us. They wrote what we have been told by those who saw these things from the beginning and who proclaimed the message. And so, Your Excellency, because I have carefully studied all these matters from their beginning, I thought it would be good to write an orderly account for you. I do this so you will know the full truth about everything which you have been taught. In that orderly, is it the most chronological of the uh, Gospels? Not the most chronological, no it isn't, because partly he organizes things. Matthew is very topical as opposed to chronological. Mark is somewhat chronological. Luke is sort of halfway between Matthew and, and, and Mark, and then the most chronological of all is John. But John didn't talk about most of what's but in the But John didn't talk about this material. That's correct. Yeah. Of course, Dr. Luke would also report a lot of what? Miracles. Miracles, especially miracles of healing, right? Yeah, yeah that would be high on his list of, of things he would be interested in. And he talks a lot about that. He also mentions certain groups of people that the other disciples, the other gospel writers almost never mention. Who would that be? Women, children, Women, Gentiles. children, Gentiles, and Samaritans. Okay. So who do you suppose tells the story of the Good Samaritan? Luke, we think. Yes, Luke. Yes, Luke. 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 Who tells the story of, of um, the one Samaritan? Remember there was the, 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 the ten lepers and Jesus healed all ten of them and only one of them came back to say thank you? Who do you suppose? Who was it that came back? The, the it was the Samaritan. Mm -hmm. And who recorded that miracle? <coughs> Luke. Uh, Uncle Luke. Yeah, exactly. He also records some very interesting details about the, the final week of Christ's life, which we'll get to in time. So, having said all of that, by the way, one other group that, that Luke is fairly, is reasonably, you know, positive about compared to the others is tax collectors. Why do you suppose that would be? Maybe he didn't have the same amount of animosity toward the Roman government as the other disciples did. Maybe That's he had a side business. <laughs> yes, I don't think so. Uh, he was also the only one of the gospel writers that spoke considerably about the folly of riches. You know, you, riches don't get you into the kingdom of heaven kind of stuff. And he, he talked about that a lot. Um, the rich man and Lazarus, too. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. Well, that, that poor Lazarus in relationship, or in comparison to the Lazarus who was Jesus' friend, was probably well to do. Let me just to review quickly those things we've mentioned. As Luke specifically, this is from the SDA Bible commentary, as Luke specifically states, he was not an eyewitness of the events he described. His gospel is both longer and more complete than any of the others. Of the 179 separate incidents recorded about the life of Christ, Luke has 118, or about 66%. Of these, 43 incidents are exclusive with Luke. They are concerned mostly with the infancy and childhood of Jesus. Now you guess that you would probably have gotten that from Mary, the mother of Jesus, after you know, some years later. Mm -hmm. And with the period of his Perean ministry, which we're talking about now, from Luke 9:51 to 18:34, to which Luke devotes 31 percent of his space. His order is more nearly chronological than that of Matthew, but not so much as that of Mark, or more especially than that of John. Luke reports 26 of the 40 parables and 20 of the 35 miracles that Jesus did. From a historical point of view, Luke is more full and complete than either of the first two Gospels, and for that matter, than John. Luke stands first in length, in completeness, in uniqueness, and in the number of miracles and parables reported. In fact, if you put the two books that Luke wrote together, Luke and Acts, they're almost as long as all the epistles that Paul wrote. Not quite, almost. But between Luke and, and Paul, they wrote something like 80% of the New Testament. Those two people wrote by far the majority of the New Testament. Mm. So, uh, let's, let's go back, let's go on. Um, what would be followers of Jesus? We're going to pick out a few things just to give you a flavor of this. As they went on their way, a man said to Jesus, I will follow... Well, I'm reading, I'm sorry, Luke 9, I'm, going, I'm starting from verse 57. As they went on their way, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. 
Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lie down and rest. Now that's not the first time he's made that statement, if you remember right. Who, who did he say that to before? Do you remember? He was to Judas, wasn't it? Yes. When Judas wanted to join the disciples, he's, this is the expression he used to speak to Judas back in Matthew. Okay? That was a year and a half before this. We don't know whether that turned this man off or not, do we? No, we don't. He said to another man, follow me. But that man said, sir, first let me go back and bury my father. Now, what's funny about that, please let me go back and bury my father. Well, they had they to buried. do it within 24 hours. Yeah, they, the, the requirement was to bury the dead within 24 hours. So, do you think if his father was already dead, he would be following Jesus off over somewhere? No, he just wanted no. to take care of his dad till he croaked. So, he's waiting to maybe go home and take care of his father for who knows how much longer. And Jesus knows that how much longer is his life going to last? Six months. Six months. So, if he's waiting for his father to die, how, how, how likely is, is he going to get any, any, any time with Jesus? Probably not, n not any. So we, it's a bit easier to understand, let the bed, dead bury their dead, you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Someone else said, I will follow you, sir, but first let me go and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus said to him, anyone who starts to plow and then keeps looking back is of no use for the kingdom of God. Hmm. Meaning, if you've ever watched someone plow behind a couple of oxen, you've got you to gotta really watch what you're doing to try to keep the, the roll fairly straight. And if you're always looking back, the row is going like this. So uh, Jesus knew about that. He knew that wasn't the right way to go. We noticed that Jesus sent out 72 disciples here in, in Perea, whereas back in Galilee, he only sent out 12, a couple, three times, three different times, yes. On that same thought, though, uh, other sources say that someone who has been a part of the message yeah. and then left it, it's almost impossible for them to come back. Well, that's a message that's, that's suggested very strongly by the book of Hebrews, which we might get into at some point. Yeah. So, okay. And so these 72 had almost the same experience as the 12 had had back in, in Jerusalem. But then Jesus makes some very interesting comments, and I'd like to know what you think about these. Look at uh, Luke 10 now. Uh, let's go to, um, well, let's go to verse 12. I assure you, he, he's talking about, if, if you go to, he's telling his 72 disciples now, if you go to, into, a, into a village and they won't accept you, they just say, get out. It says, remember that the, uh, I'm sorry, I assure you that on the judgment day, God will show more mercy to Sodom than to that town. Wow. How terrible it will be for you, Chorazin. How terrible for you, to, for you too, Bethsaida. If the miracle, miracles which were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, the people there would have long ago sat down, put on sackcloth, and sprinkled ashes on themselves to show that they had turned from their sins. God will show more mercy on the judgment day to Tyre and Sidon than to you. And as for you, Capernaum, did you want to lift yourself up to heaven? You will be thrown down to hell. Now, what do we know about Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. Capernaum was mm. a place where it was really next to where Jesus lived. Well, right that was his home yeah. during yeah. his ministry. That was his home during his ministry. What do we know about Bethsaida? That was the original home of, of Peter and Andrew, and probably James, and, possibly James and John as well. I mean, these were this was hometown for the disciples. So why would Jesus say? You're going to be worse off than Tyre, Sidon, Sodom, Gomorrah. Because you, I guess you're held accountable for what you know. Or could have known. And they have had they have had the most exposure to Jesus of any Are you population. Sure about that? Yeah. Because you know, if you're sure about that, what does that do for us? Well, it puts us in a pretty severe position. I mean, how much exposure did they have. Now, we, we don't get to see Jesus physically, but 
What a record we have. We have the old record. We have the record not only of all of his life, his death, and his resurrection, so we realize who he really was, etc. We have all of the additional insights that may have been gathered by, by Christian scholars for the last 2,000 years, and those of us who are Seventh-day Adventists feel that we have additional insights from Ellen White. So what would Jesus say to us? Go get a millstone and hang it around your neck. I hope not. <laughs> yes. Well, we're, we're all born into this sinful world. And, uh, you know, there is one verse in here somewhere that says, uh, more blessed are those who have not seen me, yet believe. Mm -hmm. So we haven't seen him, but we're here, we believe, we're trying to do That's right it. by the Lord, we're trying to walk with the Spirit. So perhaps we get some special dispensation in this evil world that we live in. I, you know, I don't know, but uh, I do know that he sits, he, the judgment throne is the mercy seat. So. Yeah. Well, um, the next thing we really come to, the next major thing we come to is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, there's several interesting things about the Good Samaritan that uh, we might want to pay a special <coughs> attention to. Um, what do we know about this story? Anything? And we've all heard the story, I, I presume, the story of the Good Samaritan. Is there any details you'd like to add that maybe not everybody knows about? Remember the story is that there's a fairly steep road that goes down from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Jericho is located a thousand feet below sea level. Jerusalem's up on the high plateau, so it's a fairly psh, trail down there. And in some spots in, in those days, it was, the trail was fairly narrow, and there are big rocks on both sides. You can imagine you're working your way down to basically a wash down from the high plateau down into the Dead Sea. And, um, you know, the only time water would go through there is if there was a real flash flood. And so, you know, big rocks on side, and it was a very easy place for robbers and that kind of people to hide. And suddenly they jump out, and they're, the, they're right on top of you almost. I mean, there's, you know... And this man was beaten and robbed, just everything, and they left him for dead beside the road. And who was he? What kind of a person was he? He was a Jew. Jew so. He was a Jew. And what happened? Three guys came well, by. Some people who, who came. was the first one that came by? A priest. A priest. And what did he do? Lost on the other side of the street. He didn't even bother to look. He just went by on the other side of the road. Well, he, he probably looked out of the corner of his eye, but he didn't, he didn't stop, he didn't slow down. What? And probably pulled his robes around him so he wouldn't get too contaminated. Yeah, and, you know, he was probably on his urgent way to business in Jerusalem, you know. Of course, now, if he perceived the gentleman was dead, then he's not supposed to touch yes. something dead. So yes. could it be argued that he uh, just figured it was dead and he needed to leave it alone? And who's next? A Levite. He would be a church worker. Yeah. Not the first priest, elder. The first elder. And what'd he do? He took a look, said, I don't think I want to get involved with this, and went on. Okay. And what happened next? Samaritan. An ugly Samaritan. Along mm -hmm. came a Samaritan. And what did he do? Took he, he gave the best first aid he knew how to give. And the Samaritan being a person who was considered unworthy and of a lower caste and class mm -hmm. by the priests and mm -hmm. the Levites and mm -hmm. Jews in general. Mm -hmm. If you were beaten up, <clears throat> your clothes had been robbed and you were destitute, how would you know whether it was a Jew or a Samaritan? I mean, that's a good question. First of all, you, you wouldn't expect that many Samaritans on that road. This is obviously Judean territory. That would be one thing. Secondly... It's, here was a Samaritan on the road. Yeah, yeah. Uh, secondly, uh, um, and he was taking great, uh, putting his life at risk by helping the guy because yeah. uh, he didn't know the robbers maybe were still behind the big rock, you know. Spend no more time there. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, that would be one thing. But probably... There were differences in the way they cut, they trimmed their hair, the way they cut their hair, all that kind of stuff. You know, the Jews, especially if they were conservative Jews, would, would keep these long curls beside their ears and so forth that we've seen. Um, so, so in a way, doesn't that make it uh, 
somewhat justifiable for the priest and the Levite to hurry on their no way. Perhaps, maybe, maybe they considered this a ruse. Yeah. If they were to stop and come aside and began to help him, maybe he was just there as bait. Yeah. So, so sure. for these to to help, uh, they might jeopardize their lives, their families. If something were to happen to them, they could end up not beaten but dead and then their families would be destitute so it just makes sense to get on around here because this could be just a Keep big moving. trick because it's not only Quickly. the Samaritans are are you know do bad things and are robbers so it makes perfect sense for the Levite okay. and the priest to zip right on by here I see okay so it wasn't a good idea for the Samaritans to stop right I mean he had a donkey not I mean, a that donkey would be worth a lot of money often often people who are the do-gooders in life are the ones who are not too bright. I, <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. The bottom line is we can justify why the priest and Levite didn't stop uh -huh. because that's us too. Yes. Well, the interesting part of that story is that the, the, the Samaritan did do his first aid. He did put the man on his donkey. He did take him to the top of the hill. He kept him overnight and looked after him at the end. And when he left, he left a considerable amount of money. Some people have estimated it was up to a month's wage for common labor with that innkeeper to say, take care of him as long as he needs to be taken care of. And if I come back and you spent more money, I will pay you at that point in time. Now this. This is a, this is a, a story. It isn't necessarily a true event. Is that okay. True? Now that now we need to go to the rest of the story. Look at Luke 10, starting with verse 25. A teacher of the law came up and tried to trap Jesus. Teacher, he said, "What must I do to receive eternal life?" Jesus answered him, "What do the scriptures say? How do you interpret them?" The man answered, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself." Now this guy probably had been doing his homework. He knew about what Jesus would have said, and, he, and you're right, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. I mean, he's answered his own question, right? But the teacher of the law wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now, who is my neighbor is something that the Jewish people argued about ad nauseum, especially the higher level, the higher classes of Jews. Should a Pharisee talk to a Sadducee? Should either one of them talk to the ordinary people at the lower levels of society. In general, they would say no. Not even talk to them, let alone do anything for them. And those are Jews. We're not talking about foreigners. We're not talking about Samaritans or Greeks. We're talking about Jews, mm -hmm. okay? And so um, Jesus tells this story. And the interesting thing is, if you turn to the writings of Ellen White, she says the Levite and the priest were in the audience as he told this story. Furthermore, this was, a, this was a story that was widely known. People knew about this story. So the people there weren't guessing about whether Jesus was telling the truth. It was a known story. It was a true story. It was a known story. It had made the headlines. It had made the headlines of those days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very interesting situation. Probably by the guy who got healed himself yeah. and started telling people what, he, what the Samaritan had done for him. Right. So what are we supposed to learn from this story? given those extra details. Before anybody expounds too much, we've got to take a break right now. I want you to think about this. Where would you be in this story? Would you be the Levite? Would you be the priest? Would you be the man who was robbed? Or would you be the Good Samaritan?
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to join us and rejoin us. We've been talking about the story of the Good Samaritan, and we learned that the priest and the Levite who passed by on the other side were there in the crowd when Jesus told this story. How do you suppose they felt? They probably said the same things that Jay just said. Mm -hmm. I couldn't risk stopping for fear of whatever reason they had. Mm -hmm. And what did the young man say to Jesus after he told the story? Jesus said, verse 36, in your opinion, which one of these three acted like a neighbor toward the men attacked by the robbers? And he said, well, the Samaritan, of course, didn't he? Not in those words. He, could, he, <laughs> he, he couldn't bring himself to say that. <laughs> the teacher of law answered, the one who was kind to him. I mean, they couldn't even, he couldn't even bring himself to mention the name of the Samaritan. And Jesus replied, you go then and do the same thing. I've talked about this parable several times with medical students that I've mm -hmm. been involved with. And, you know, we try to speculate what is the, rel what is the comparison today? Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have said, well... You know, if I was driving through the ghetto, would I stop and help someone that was by the road? We know about the traps, mm -hmm. just as the Jews, just as the Levite and the, and the priest knew about. We know we could be in big danger, so what do we do? Mm -hmm. Take it's a another, dilemma. Take another route. <laughs> don't, don't even go on that road. <laughs> Well, in this case, it was the only road. <clears throat> if you needed to get from Jericho to Jerusalem, or vice versa, it was the only way to go. I suppose, I suppose you could drive, you could go through Samaritan territory all the way up to Galilee and cross the river up there if you like, or maybe down through Ai. It was yeah, a long way around. So is there a current day correlate of the story? Yes, I think there is. We have been so blessed in every possible way as Christians, and I would say as Seventh-day Adventists. And we look at the people out there, the drunks on the corner ask, begging for a dollar or something so they can, saying they, want, they need some food or they need to feed their family or whatever, and they're probably going to use it to buy more alcohol or something. And we say, pass them by. Try not to look at them. You might be inclined to stop and give them something, you know. I have a friend who um, I admire for this particular trait. I've, I've never tried it. Um, I don't very often find myself in this situation, but often there are beggars out beside the grocery stores in this area. And um, they're, they're, they'll often cost you when you're on the way into the, into the market. And he says, well, hold on just a minute. I'll get you something. And he would go in and do his shopping. As he does his shopping, he would collect a certain amount of food items in a separate bag, <coughs> check out. When he goes out, the guy's still there. He gives him the food. What do you think of that? I think that's great. I've offered people, you know, I often carry granola bars in my car. My wife knows about this. And people have uh, come up to me in parking lots, and I, I offer them granola bars. They're not interested, usually. Mm-hmm. They, they, have, they haven't even been willing to take them. They want really? the cash. Absolutely. They want the money. Yeah. So, so am I justified? Probably in that circumstance, yes. <laughs> I'm not too far away. I wasn't away. looking for justification. I'm not too far away. You see the guy, I just want a beer. It's, mm -hmm. The sign held out, so at least he's being honest, I guess. <laughs> I offered to fill up a lady's tank once and went to the service station and her big old car only took a gallon. Oh. But on the other side of that, um, I've gotten uh, gift cards to Del Taco. Mm -hmm. $5 gift card. So when That's I encounter these people. I did that and included a book with it. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Well, <coughs> Jesus is, as we've said, is, is busy sort of teaching and so forth. Let me, let me ask this, Kim. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, we have 
I'm going to ask you because I can't think of any instance right mm -hmm. now, but are there, you know, we've got lots of stories about Jesus helping people. Are there any, any stories that you can think of where Jesus helped somebody and then um, you or I would have been sorry that they, that they betrayed this trust that they gave him? Are there any stories in Luke or Matthew yeah, or Mark course. where, hmm? you know, he healed somebody or, or what have you? And I'm thinking of the ten lepers. Yeah. Only, what, one or two? Only one Only came one back. Came the back. others just accepted the gift and ran. Yeah. Well, and there's, and there's other cases like that. Uh, you know, I'm sure the ten were thankful. They may not have come back to say it, but they were, they were certainly thankful that they had been healed of leprosy. Um, I don't think of any times when, when they were, you know, specifically, so Jesus would have been sorry, we would have been sorry that we did something like that. Uh, obviously, he healed many people. There were times when he went through villages and healed everybody in the whole village, according to Desire of Ages. Um, I, w I wonder if there were any of those who had been healed who were in the crowd calling for his crucifixion. That's a good question. Uh, Ellen White seems to hint that maybe that was true. She also says that there were many of those people out there on Pentecostal, in the, in the morning of Pentecost, that were, that were very excited and ready to stand up. And, and 3,000 people were baptized in one day. It wasn't just because of Peter's sermon. And there were many of those that were the Pharisees and Sadducees too? Quite a few Pharisees and possibly some Sadducees that at that point said, hey, you know, this, 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 this movement's going somewhere. Yeah. Well, um, understanding, moving on through the, the story of Luke, uh, this part of the, of the Gospel of Luke, like I said, there are many parts, that, things that are being repeated from his previous uh, experiences. I would like to come over to um, chapter 15. And we, we have the story of the lost sheep. There was one out of a hundred sheep that was lost. And the shepherd went out to hunt for them. There was a lost coin. The woman lost one coin. She swept her house and cleaned it up until she found it. And then there's the famous story of the lost son, or what we sometimes call the prodigal son. Um, it really probably, honestly, ought to be called the parable of the loving father. You remember the story, what happened? There was two brothers. The younger brother, normally the older brother would get what percentage? No, an extra portion. Yeah, an extra portion, which would be two portions for the older brother and one portion for the younger brother. Why did he get two portions? He took care of the father. He and was mother. expected to care for the parents when they got older. Yeah, so that would have been in the normal way it would be divided. So when this younger brother said, I want my portion, I'm out of here, he probably got a third of the estate. We don't know whether the father sold property or sold, you know, livestock or whatever, but somehow or other he got together this money and handed it to the son, and the son disappeared into a far country. And he spent his money on, you know, riotous, riotous is. living, as it sometimes says. Yeah. And what happened then? Well, his money ran out. And things got bad yeah. over there. Drought. And well, there was a famine. Famine. And... Uh, as a good Jew, he ended up feeding the pigs. Yeah, well, he didn't have any property, any home to go home, go back to no. in that territory. No. He, he had no way of, uh, uh, you know, saying, well, you know, my, my friends at home, you need to take care of me. No. None of that kind of stuff. Till finally got tired of eating husks from the corn, what did he do? Well, he said, he, said he thought to himself for a little while first and said, you know, here I am in this condition even the servants back home get treated better than this. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could talk Dad into treating me like a servant and I could at least have good food and a place to stay. Well, what happened on his way home as he got near home? Well, his father saw him a long look at verse, ways off. Look at verse 20. This is Luke 15, verse 20. So he got up and started back to his father. He was still a long way from home when his father saw him. His heart was filled with pity, and he ran, threw his arms around his son, and kissed him. Now, what do we learn from that verse? That's a very important verse. 
What do we learn from that verse? The father had been watching every single day. The father was had his eye on that road. Every, every time he wasn't tied up with something else, he was watching down that road. And when he saw the son coming in, he must have identified him by the way he walked or something like that because he wasn't dressed in finery like he was, had been dressed on his way out of there. He ran down and grabbed him and dressed him up and brought him back and said, let's feast. This is an easy one to ask the question, what does this say about God? <laughs> yeah. What does it say about God? Well, I mean, I, I, don't, I hope there's none of us that have any question about the fact that this parable is to teach us something about God's attitude towards sinners. That's right. And he receives us back with open arms. And Jesus had said the same thing back up at the end of the first parable, the lost sheep. In the same way I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 respectable people who do not need to repent. So, I mean, Jesus already set, he already set things up for what he's going to say here on this, in this parable, right? Well, the father said, let's get ready, let's celebrate, and what happened next? The older brother didn't think it was such a good idea. He didn't think it was such a good idea. This younger brother had wasted a, his third, and he was gone, and he didn't deserve anything, and so forth. And the father said, we're celebrating because... You're brother was dead and now is alive. And why are we celebrating that? He's back. This was the father celebration. Yeah. The father says, I am so happy to have my son home. You know. So this so this is we are in a sense the the younger brother and Jesus sees Some of us. us. Some of us. Something Some like of us that. can be the older brother. And yes, yes. And, we, and those of us who are the older brother need to realize have mercy on the younger brother. <laughs> is this be a, as happy uh, as, as the father was. Is this a commentary on uh, the relationship of the Gentiles and the Jews? Well, it certainly could be, huh? Or but, even uh, the Gentile, uh, or the Jews and the Samaritans even, who were yeah. kind of cousins, I guess. That, uh, that here we have um, Jesus being inclusive in his ministry, not yep. just Exclusive. to the Jews, but to others. And the Jews were resistant to this. Christ Object Lessons 202, <laughs> paragraph 1 says, It was that love which was drawing him towards home. So... It is the assurance of God's love that constrains the sinner to return to God. Mm -hmm. Said in the context of, you don't need to get yourself ready before God will accept you. Yeah, exactly. By the way, all this was happening where? What did we say? Where, where is this taking place? On the other side of the Jordan. The other side of the Jordan in a amidst a bunch of Gentiles, right? Yeah. How do you suppose the disciples were surviving over there? Were they learning anything about tolerance? I mean, they had to sleep in the Gentile towns and the Gentile homes. They may, may have found some Jews over there that they could stay with. I don't know how much of the time. But this is basically Gentile territory. Education. And they're spending six months there. Yes. Well, the last six months was spent in Gentile territory, too. Yeah. Yeah. The whole true. year. Exactly. Yeah. Well. And I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's yeah. interesting. A whole year, that would be one third of the portion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, moving on, we come what to. What do we learn from the older brother? Yeah. The older brother was so much like the Jewish leaders and so much like so many Christians today. He was following all of the rules. Following all the rules and he expected to get rich doing that. You know, it's nothing, it, the story doesn't have a pleasant ending as far as the, the older brother is concerned. It's really kind of a sad commentary on so he, the older brother was not happy with the cheap 
saving, cheap yeah. grace that the younger son got, huh? That's right. Yeah. And the father didn't say, hey, you know, we're glad you're back, but, you know, you got to do this and this and this. Yeah, Jump over that. these hoops and over those hurdles. And, and uh, no, I'm just glad he, you're home. He gave him that ring. Now, yeah. you know, we would say, well, he's trying to make him look nice. No, oh. that ring had an insignia on the back of it, and that would be what you would use to sign it, the equivalent of signing a check mm -hmm. in our day. Well, and the older son was having to apoplexy because of... Well, not only that, but he's having to make all these preparations for this party. This is, this is the same issue that was in the, the parable of the laborers mm -hmm. who were out somewhere in the field all day long and some came in the last hour. Mm -hmm. And the older brother here is playing the part of those who labored all day. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, you know, that's, a, that's another story. We, we sort of jumped over it, but... What, I mean, you know, that guy, the, the master of that place, that vineyard, did everything he possibly could to upset people. There's a lot of things he could have done to just, I mean, what if he just played the people who worked all day first? Let them go. And then you want to pay the other people who came later the same amount of money? Well, at least you don't upset the other people. He paid the people who came last he paid them first. So everybody could see that. So everybody could see exactly what was going on. So we're talking about the parable in Matthew 20. Mm -hmm. Start of Matthew 20. Yeah. Is that right? It's coming up. Yeah. yeah. But it's about the same time. Yeah. So let, let's look at Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, Luke 16, starting with verse 19. We have the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. It's a very, very... Uh, confusing parable. Confusing parable. parable. What this do we? One of those stories that Luke shouldn't have put in. <laughs> one of the stories that Luke <laughs> shouldn't have, have put in. It would have been a lot see. easier for some of if us you if were Luke, editing. Uh, Luke had left this one out. Uh huh. Okay. Well, there was once a rich man who dressed in the most expensive clothes and lived in great luxury every day. There was also a poor man. I'm still reading from, starting from verse 19. Luke 16. Luke 16, okay. verse 19. There was also a poor man named Lazarus, and that name is significant, we'll see in a little bit, covered with sores, who used to be brought to the rich man's door, hoping to eat the bits of food that fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. What do you suppose that did for his sores? Kept him wet. <laughs> <laughs> and the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the feast in heaven. The rich man died and was buried, and in Hades, where he was in great pain, he, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. So he called out, Father Abraham, take pity on me and send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and cool off my tongue because I am in great pain in this fire. But Abraham said, Remember, my son, that in your lifetime you were given all the good things while Lazarus got all the bad things. But now he's enjoying himself here while you are in pain. Besides all that, there is a deep pit lying between us, so that those who want to cross over from here to you cannot do so, nor can anyone cross over to us from where you are. The rich man said, Then I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house where I have five brothers. Let him go and warn them so that they at least will not come to this place of pain. It's quite remarkable that this very selfish old man is now thinking of his brothers now that he's in the hellfire, right? Yeah. Abraham said, Your brothers have Moses and the prophets to warn them. Your brothers should listen to what they say. The rich man answered, That is not enough, Father Abraham. But if someone would, will rise from death and go to them, then they will turn from their sins. But Abraham said, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone were to rise from death. Okay, now there's several important things for, for us to learn from this thing. First of all, what was, the, what was the main point for Jesus telling this strange story? Study the, what was, we call today the Old Testament. That's where you don't, and Jesus did that same thing after he rose on this uh, road to Emmaus he, with the disciples. He says he led them to the Old Testament and mm -hmm. revealed who he was. However, this business, well, if somebody dies and comes back from the dead, then the whole world's going to wander after him. Uh, I've heard that on so-called Christian-type TVs. But Jesus says, 
Well, remember that when Lazarus, him, the friend of Jesus, was raised back to life, the leaders plotted to kill him. Yeah. It, it didn't change their heart of stone no. into a heart of flesh. It just, uh, they wanted to kill him, and then they made their plans to kill Jesus. And they says, hey, Lord, uh, the whole world gets, excuse me, the word gets out about Jesus. The whole world's going to follow after him. And <laughs> yeah. Well, so what we've seen here is that Jesus tells this story, and the point of the story is, if they won't listen to the Bible that they have in their hand, they're not going to be moved even if someone rises from the dead. And proof of that, as Jim has just mentioned, is a story coming up shortly where he literally did raise from the dead a man by the name of Lazarus. Isn't that an interesting coincidence? And that man, it made the, Fer the Sadducees so angry because they, they had one, of their, one of their favorite doctrines is the idea that you know, you better get as much as you can for yourself during this life because when, you're di when you die, you're dead a long time. There's no resurrection, there's no afterlife, there's no nothing. And Jesus just proved that people can rise from the dead. And that made them very angry. Uh, another lesson that he was trying to say is that your riches aren't what count. Because <clears throat> mm -hmm. the rich man was... Suffering in the flames. Was suffering in the flames and the poor man was where they thought they had a right to be. Paradise. Why did Jesus tell an untrue parable to teach a point? Can't he stick with the truth? Well, <laughs> let's talk about that, and let's talk about the rest of the details of this parable, because there's some very interesting details. Well, but um, what, what, what's wrong with this parable? Well, let's, let's, let's talk about that. Would God ever say to somebody, love me, or I'll burn you in hell forever. Sure, it says it right here. One thing you can be <laughs> sure. I'm asking, is the God that you know, would he do that? I think for many people, the answer to that is yes. Well, see, you and people have been, that from you, this story. You, you people have already heard this story too many times. <laughs> you see, because most Christians, if you said that, oh no, we don't believe that. But then if you stop and think through carefully what they do believe, that's exactly what they do believe. Yes. Now, they don't think that they're going to go to hell. Or they don't think any of their friends are going to go to hell, but they think some people are going to go to hell. Or should. Or should, at least. <laughs> and, and be in that fire perpetually tormented, <laughs> tortured. And where did that all notion come from? This story right here. No. From, this, from the belief from the Greek, of the eternal, well, the immortality of the soul. Yeah. But that was Greek, ancient Greek yeah, thinking. That was too. Well, but if you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, You're not gonna die. Satan said die. what? You will not die. And he'd been promoting that idea from back then until now. When you, when you die on this earth, you really just go into, into a different, another kind of existence. Christ Object Lessons uh, 263, paragraph 2. In this parable, Christ was meeting the people on their own ground. Mm -hmm. The doctrine of a conscious state in the existence between death and the resurrection was held by many of those who were listening to Christ's words. The Savior knew their ideas, and he framed his parable so as to inculcate important truths through these preconceived opinions. Yes. Well, this story is only a slight modification of a story that had been, had been told, made up, I presume, many hundreds of years earlier in Egypt. The, the farthest back we can trace it is in Egypt. It was, a, it was a story that came from Egypt, but it was a familiar story. People knew about this basic story. Okay? It, so if it came out of Egypt, what, was, what would have been the context there? Some, well, some, remember some the gods Egyptian, or some? Remember, the Egyptians went to elaborate processes to preserve a body, prepare it to carry it across the river of death and into the whole the mummification next, thing. The whole mummification, et cetera, et cetera thing. Mm -hmm. So this fits right in with their theology. See? So that, that okay. Well, the interesting thing is that um, I'd like to quote from our Anglican friends a little bit. The Anglican Church has recently conducted a council to study this matter and has come to the following conclusions, talking about the issue of hellfire. In our discussion, this is quoting from the Anglicans. Of course, in, now Previously, they have this, they have held this position yeah. about yeah. Uh, what happens eternally to burning hell, and this is in a book entitled <coughs> "The Mystery of Salvation," page one ninety nine in their book. And if you if you're interested in looking at some of these materials, they're available on our website 
That's Theox, that's T H E O X dot O R G. These materials are right there. In our discussion, we encounter particular difficulty because the dualist assumptions about human beings, body and soul, which underline much of traditional Christian thinking, notice underline much of traditional Christian thinking on these subjects, are not commonly held these days. They recognize, this is the Anglicans recognize, that Calvin was the origin of much of this kind of thinking, and then this is their conclusion. In the past, the imagery of hellfire and the eternal torment and punishment often sadistically expressed, has been used to frighten men and women into believing, or perhaps behaving, and doing what we tell you to do, right? Christians have professed appalling theologies which made God into a sadistic monster and left searing psychological scars on many. Hell is not, and then their final line, hell is not eternal torment, but it is the final and irrevocable choosing of that which is opposed to God so completely and so absolutely that the only end is total non-being. Yeah. Yay, Anglicans. I think they did a good job. They did. I think they did that. What? I think the Anglican Church did that about 1997. Yeah, something like that a few years ago. Yeah. Now, the, the Episcopalians, they're an offshoot from the Anglican Church? Not an offshoot, they're a, the American branch. American branch, yeah. okay. Um, so one of the issues here is that, uh, what about this? Is this true? Where, and, and those who believe in the non-immortality of the soul, that believe that people can die and, and lie buried in the grave until Jesus calls them forth in a kind of resurrection, as Seventh-day Adventists believe, uh, would agree with this position, very much this position uh, held by, by some Anglicans, not all of them, some Anglicans. Well, we're running out of time. And in this portion of the life of Christ, we see that Jesus is speaking to Gentiles. He's repeating many of his lessons that he had given earlier to the Jews in Galilee and in Judea. And he's specifically talking about things like the parable of, 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 the, of the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son, and these other parables that speak very specifically to the issue about what kind of a person God is, and they say wonderful things about him, in my opinion, I hope in yours also. See you next week.